By mid-2011, the hype train for what Marvel was doing with their interconnected series of films, known as the MCU, was at an all-time high. Having taken a grounded look at Iron Man in the modern world twice by this point, which both took form as near-future science fiction action flicks, then there was the Incredible Hulk, which played out as a character study with a fugitive plotline, and then a Shakespearean take on the very ungrounded character of Thor. Meaning that the time was right to bring one of the most important characters in Avenger history to the silver screen, and that would be Captain America. Directed by Joe Johnston, most known for humming another Americana period piece, The Rocketeer, as well as everyone's favorite, Jurassic Park. Alan. Captain America, the first Avenger, follows the adventures of the first Avenger, a title that actually has always kind of bothered me a little bit, pretty much because it precedes the in-universe explanation of just what an Avenger actually is. You were the world's first superhero. Then what is this a nod to? At any rate, Joe Johnson filled a superhero World War II action flick chock full of actors and CGI that range from okay to amazing, as well as a ton of references to the MCU, the comics that inspired this film, and a deeper meaning that will knock you in the jaw. Or not. It's gonna be great, let's go. I'm gonna do this all day. In a very The Thing inspired opening sequence, we open up somewhere where it's quite cold, which based on the maps from Iron Man 2, as well as Cap's later trajectory, is probably somewhere it's the little east of Greenland. By the way, in universe, S.H.I.E.L.D. must really prioritize sarcasm in job screenings. Are you the guys from Washington? You get many other visitors out here? I mean, the guy's like just doing his job in sub-zero temperatures. Anyway, a ship unlike any ever seen has been located by some Russians and upon entering the vessel, the capsicle is found. At this point, we jump back in time to see how we got to this future, which would make this the third out of five MCU films to rely on this opening sequence time jump gimmick to frame the narrative. Cut to 1942 and a Nazi spinoff regime is attacking the small town known as Tonsberg. Sorry, I can only say that as a Missouri hillbilly, no disrespect intended to the place which seems to be as connected to Asgard as the pronunciation of the place I screwed up last week, which is the New Mexican town we see in Thor. You'd be forgiven for not knowing that, but it seems like these locations are as connected to Asgard via the Rainbow Road. And at least in the case of Tonsberg, the people were helped out when the Frost Giants invaded Midgard a thousand years ago, which is where our story begins. Now the Jewel of Odin's treasure room, AKA the Cosmic Cube, AKA the Tesseract, AKA the Space Stone, would end up residing in Tonsberg. And I'm not 100% sure on how that happens. Maybe if you have an infinity stone in your grasp, just keep it in your treasure room next to your all powerful killing Alexa machine. Oh, and Tonsberg, by the way, is the same location the Asgardians found new Asgard much later in the timeline. Back to 1942, that branch off the Nazi regime is known as Hydra. And I've seen a lot of people complain about how this logo looks, which, you know, again, he says, if they cut off one head, more shall take its place. And this thing just has one head, so I get the complaint, but also Schmitty here is kind of an arrogant fella, so I can assume that this logo was just meant to represent him as the Red Skull. See, the blood on his thing was the red from the skull, teasing that he is the Red Skull. More on that later. Hydra seeking out that very specific artifact, and Schmidt uses his punching tank to knock open the doors of this church. Coming up empty after searching a Viking sarcophagus, Elrond gets very creative in order to get the help from the elderly church guy to help give up the location of the Tesseract. Finding in the Asgardian tree that my Missouri hillbilly accent won't even attempt, Yggdrasil. the Tesseract is now in Hydra's hands, and the director of the film perhaps references a movie he worked on years prior. And the In all fairness, Hitler's real life interest in the occult ranges from curiosity to full on obsession, depending on what time of the day you're watching the History Channel. So the story here fits nicely as it is an offshoot of our own reality. Heading to the 1940s New York skyline, a tiny Steve Rogers with all of the elements, even this one spelled wrong, is rejected from going to war once more. Going to the theaters to blow off some steam, little Johnny Storm demonstrates both his unwillingness to take guff from bullies 
as well as his ability to take guff from bullies, a character trait which would persist throughout his arc in the MCU. Save by what in my head canon is just a very late Bucky, a character trait that would also stick with him throughout the MCU. Later in the day, now connecting us to Iron Man 2, Bucky and his plucky sidekick are on a double date at the Stark Expo with Queen Victoria and the other woman. The diminutive Roger steps out to hit the waffle stand and try for a fiver for F. Bucky stops Steve short of the weirdest amusement ride ever, and the two have a perfectly executed exposition drop for the pioneers of a sneaky Stanley Tucci. These sentences actually even render in people's brains. <laughs> Based on his personality alone, stunted Steve is approved for the strategic scientific reserve. And look, PSA, if you ever find yourself being recruited with flying colors, even though you don't have any of the prerequisites met whatsoever by a sketchy scientist with the US government for like an off books shady experiment, then it means that you're going to be used by the US government for shady off the books experimentation. And that can never be good. What kind of monster would let a German scientist experiment on them to protect their country? We're not at war, Captain. She's right. Governments are shady as Satan and especially shady during wartime. Perfect cut to the Australian Alps, we find our first look at Hugo's Bond-inspired villainous lair. Complete with lots of foreshadowing, we see the Hydra bigwigs are trying to tap into Tesseract as an energy source in order to bottle up for their weaponry later. With the pint-sized private now at Camp Leahy, the plot of land in New Jersey, which also seems to hold significant value to the MCU as it's visited again in the 70s, and again in the 2000s, and again sometime in the mid 2020s. Oh, and some zombie stuff happens there in an alternate universe. Anyway, it's here we're both introduced to Haley Atwell throwing a haymaker at a new recruit, and Tommy Lee Jones playing Tommy Lee Jones. As the montage proceeds, it's clear that the Tooch is favoring the Wee Rogers, while Chester is pronounced Colonel. It's the highest rank in the military. Right. Colonel Chester Phillips is wanting to stick it out with this tall drink of water. After some psychological torture, Grenade! Get away! Rogers is ultimately chosen. As Dr. Erskine explains, the serum amplifies what's inside. Good becomes great, so on and so forth. It also makes you really strong and really jumpy. At the Hydra base, Claudius Templesmith looks over some photos confirming that Caesar Flickerman is now working with the US government. From what we know now, they have a guy on the inside, so let's remember, because this is probably a setup for a surprise late in the film. On the way to the secret SSR base in Brooklyn, Runty Rogers confirms to Carter that he's never so much as talked to a woman for more than 30 seconds. Check this off his list now, he can now let the US government pump him full of whatever they want. The capification operation is assisted by a young Howard Stark, making this the third actor to play the character across the budding MCU. The experiment is viewed by a committee of suits and some uniforms, and the procedure goes off without so much as a hitch. And Chris Evans was so hot that Haley couldn't help but touch him. While celebrating the modern Marvel, a nefarious looking man pulls a gun and sets off an explosion, killing the Tooch and resulting in a pretty heartfelt moment. But also, we maybe have set up the spy in a different way, or like, do we even need the setup for the spy at all? It just happened in the previous scene. Like, maybe they just could have put some photos strung out in the background in the first evil lair scene. I don't know, it just felt like, Trust your audience. Like, I'm just saying, we didn't need this scene at all. Like, Chris, how else could we establish that his face was really, really red? With his newfound body, Beefy Rogers pursues the assassin, donning a star-spangled shield and, quite frankly, impressive diving skills. Not getting much out of this Hydra agent, though, Cap laments at the loss of his maker, but it's clear that he's a full-blown hero now. Cut to the other side of the planet, Schmidt declares Hydra's independence from the Nazi regime and uses his newfound guns, making it clear that he's a full-blown villain now. Which, by the way, if you don't know, the Nazis did occupy Norway starting in 1940, making this line a little weird. We had learned through local intelligence you had mounted a full-scale incursion into Norway. But with the science guy of SSR now out of commission, Tommy Lee Jones feels a little slighted by this whole process. 
doesn't really see the use for one nice guy with muscles, but the senator sure does. With all due respect to the colonel, I think we may be missing the point. I've seen you in action, Steve. More importantly, the country's seen it. It's here we get a montage that serves as meta commentary on how the real comic book character was used in real life to help sell war bonds. Cap's suit here is an homage to his original costume, and the Hitler punch is easily one of the most iconic references that this film could make. While Cap's getting busy on the USO tour, Captain America, fuck! Hydra's getting busy building their infrastructure, like comically large infrastructure. The size of this factory is stupidly big. Rogers overhears that his old pal Bucky is stuck behind enemy lines goes to work infiltrating the Hydra Space Gym fluid factory and mostly a flawless victory. By the way, the Hydra guys kind of look like the Shy Guys from the Mario Bros film in the 90s, setting hundreds of captives free. Roger solos it now, immediately finding his old pal Bucky in this enormous facility. Cap rescues Bucky from what seems to be an experimentation room. I wonder if that's ever going to come up at all. But now with the base on full alert, a self-destruct sequence is underway. Cap and Buck square off against Schmidt and Zola, only to be separated by plot reasons. And it's here we get to see Megatron's second phase, the Red Skull, which I'm glad the film went out of its way to tease that his face was red several times throughout this. The trailers gave it away. What do you expect? He was also on the movie poster here too. I, I, I just don't know why the film felt like this was such a revealing moment, but I get it. I guess if he was just red the whole time, it wouldn't make sense. I do like his design in this film so much more than that 90s version that traumatized me as a kid. So while the bad guys get away in very Saturday morning cartoon types of way, Bucky and Captain America have to cross a tightrope in order to escape. The makeshift bridge collapses and Cap goes literal smoke show for the audience. Cut to Tommy Lee Jones, writing a KIA letter to Roger's very deceased parents is interrupted by a Cap-led prodigious parade of captivating ex-captives. Really teaches you not to leap to conclusions. Very, I'm just saying, it's very Saturday morning cartoon, this whole thing right here. We get three hurrahs for the film's titular hero, and we close out with steamy Steve Rogers finally finding his purpose in life. Roll credit. <laughs> Medal for Valor. Right. So I don't, again, I don't understand why the crowd is like cheering Cap and the camera's panning away. And then quickly we get the voiceover. I just, it feels, it feels like this was the end of the movie. All right, let's skip through some stuff. The film certainly does. The SSR is now fully dedicated to taking down one clear and distinct enemy, Hydra. If you're not in the know, SSR is the foundation of S.H.I.E.L.D. later, meaning that this really created a plot line of the two being diametrically opposed forces that would last 70 years into phase two. We also get a sequence of Cap selecting his crew, which consists of the bowler hat guy, who's played by the bad guy on Walking Tall, among other things. He also voiced Bruce Banner several times, so there's a Marvel connection for you. Bowler Hat does pop up in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., along with Kenneth Choi, who also plays his literal grandson in the Spider-Man films. But at this point in the MCU, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that he's some sort of immortal being content to just hide in the shadows until Kevin Feige wants him to rise to action. Other commandos include Puff Daddy, Union Jack, and Bruno Ricci of Captain America, the first Avenger fame. By the way, the bartender here was a body double for Little Rogers, which is a very interesting claim to fame. Moving on, we get a very brief corrupt the cap sequence where Marjorie Tyrell tries to kiss the sexiest man of live, kind of giving us the sense that maybe Cap might be corruptible. But that quickly goes nowhere, and the concept is literally never touched again in the entire MCU. Agent Carter's a little pissed about it, though. In a very Q-inspired scene, Stark displays his best innovative and inventive shields, but Cap picks the prototype Vibranium one, which Stark confirms why government contracts to the industrial war complex often waste just so much money. The rarest metal on Earth 
Let's make a little disc. That's the rarest metal on earth. What you're holding there, that's all we've got. Stops angry Peggy's pistol though. Meanwhile, an angry Agent Smith is driving through the fiery remains of presumably a string of SSR Hydra hit bases. And I know the Red Skull says this. That we are continually delayed because you cannot out with a simpleton with a shield. But I don't really get the point of Hydra weapons if it shoots single fire. I mean like regular bullets that shoot single fire also stop people at nearly the same rate, especially in movies. I mean, it does seem easier to clean up the mess using Zola weapons, so there's a win. At this point, we get some shots which mimic the mimicry films from earlier in this film. America, yeah. Infiltrating a train to try to kidnap the auctioneer from everyone's other favorite Jurassic film, Bucky and Cap find themselves separated, having to beat their own levels of difficulty boss. Just kidding, Cap goes real Casey Jones on his mini boss, and they take out Tommy Lee's guy together. Sorry, this Tommy Lee and not that Tommy Lee. Bucky's tossed from the train in an explosion, which leaves Cap sad for about a scene and a half. Zola is then interrogated by this Tommy Lee, revealing that Hydra's planning on bobbing everywhere. This then leads to a scene which gets me every single time. Okay, so Hugo walks in, he faces the camera, he looks around, he then turns his back to the camera. Now the camera's on the other side, we get a low medium shot looking up towards him, speaking to his squad of about 10 shy guys outside his Koopa stealth airship. And then he goes over his nefarious plans. I get it. These are his most trusted guys, his hardcore crew of rough and tough soldiers who won't crumble to cap like a discarded piece of paper. As the sequence ends, though, he turns around and poof, there's like conservatively a thousand dudes here. I just don't get the point of framing it this way. We already know he has an army. It seems completely unnecessary. And again, just very Saturday morning-ish. Captain Carter now having a drinking scene in which Peggy talks about how we need to respect people we work with to the point that we can release them from the burden when things don't work out the way that we want them to. Cut to a planning sequence and we get the final conflict laid out for us. Cap goes on as a one-man wrecking crew. And wrecks havoc on the Hydra agents, blowing off Tesseract shots like they're nothing, and then gets stopped by like, two guys with flamethrowers. It's like they forgot he could jump or throw a shield or something. But getting caught was his plan. This is such a great line, by the way. Arrogance may not be a uniquely American trait, but I must say you do it better than anyone. But as V's about to put Rogers out of commission, the slowly advancing Howling Commandos are just zip lining across the mountain range when in real life, the bad guys would just, you know, they'd have so much time to just slowly turn and shoot these guys while they're still 50 yards out. Nevertheless, this spies the distraction the cap needs. Pew, 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 run, shield throw, Carter X Machina, pew, 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 shield throw, Tommy Lee Jones X Machina. And now Cap has mere seconds to catch up to that plane and Carter sheds all professionalism and kisses her cap. On the plane, Rogers makes quick work of most of the bad guys. Kind of wish this guy would have stabbed him though, just to pay off Howard's line earlier. Hydra's not gonna attack you with a pocket knife. Last minute though, Cap has to stop one of these mini bombers. So he does. Crashing his bullet bill into the big airship, Cap makes it to the main bridge and the big boss fight now commences. It's at this point in the MCU, the trope of basically having the yin yang version of the hero is getting really played out. This now makes four out of five films where the bad guy's basically a palette swap version of the good guy, with the only outlier being Thor, whose main antagonist was the concept of boredom. This fight really does feel like it has no consequences though, because a punch from one of these guys is equally leveled, a punch to the jaw to the red skull from a guy who literally defines what jaw lines are doesn't really make for an engaging dramatic sequence. I'm assuming Johnston knew this, which is why this fight is seemingly cut very short, with the Red Skull grabbing the Tesseract after Cap's shield seemed to have activated it, thus melting his face in the same way the Ark of the Covenant did to the rest of the Nazis in World War II. I do have an open question here though. Where did Red Skull go from here? We're all left to assume he died. Most of us assumed he did not die, but he does show his crimson face again on Vormir. He kind of talks in riddles there, so I'm not really sure if he teleported straight to Vormir to become this phantomy fella, 
or if he had a space odyssey of his own that ultimately ended on Vormir. If it's the latter, I'm sure we should get a Disney Plus series about it. We could call it Skulking for Stones, Schmitty Goes to Space, Code Red, or just no, cut. During the battle, the controls of the ship were damaged and the flight has to use autopilot. And it was really kind of Schmidt to label all of this in English as opposed to earlier in the film. I didn't know you spoke German. We determined that the autopilot is taking the plane to New York and the final payload is still crashed into the back of the plane. I don't get why he doesn't just go out there and like kick the bomb out into the ocean and have some other jets scramble for him. I don't know. It just seems like he just went down with the ship a little too easy. Fast forward 70 years and S.H.I.E.L.D. constructs an entire facade to ease Rogers into the 21st century. Yet chooses a baseball game from at least a year prior to the kickoff of the film. Just seems like a weird thing for an organization to just consider good enough, good enough here. But I guess considering that half of their agents are now secretly Hydra agents, I guess it checks out. I've heard plenty of theories here too that S.H.I.E.L.D. was attempting to try to get Rogers to figure it out on his own. But seeing as how this seems hastily put together here, the dame here wasn't really an army regulation. She's wearing modern bra and for real how long could this have actually tricked captain america these backdrops are easily 10 feet away meaning that if he just gets up and looks outside the window he's gonna see that he's in some big weird sound stage all of this does remind me of one of steven spielberg's most poignant flops but i don't really know what we're going for here back out to our century it turns out that cap's icy grave was more like a cryogenic chamber, and Steve Rogers is now an elder millennial. The end tag for Captain America gives us a scene ripped straight from the next film, as well as a trailer for that film. So to see what's underneath the frozen surface of the first Avenger, let's dive into the deeper meaning. The film wants its cake, and it wants to eat it too, which I hate that phrase. I don't know why we always use it, but it works. I don't want to kill anyone. Right, so Captain America, the film, had a lot of work cut out for it. It was a period piece which needed to establish an honestly outdated character within the grounded vibe of the universe that Marvel was building. It must also pay off comic book nerd fan service. It has to connect to the other films. It has to set up the Avengers crossover. It has to contain wit, action, huge set pieces, hop from past to the present, establish Hydra, set up a sequel. It also was released in 3D as well, which explains the shoehorning in of very specific shots. But most of all, it had to make sweet, sweet cash. With so many boxes to cross off that list, and so many of them were executed excellently, by the way. It certainly feels like the depth of this film and the character arcs within fell a bit stale, which honestly was already a difficult task when you factor in that the main character of the film is practically infallible. Minnie Rogers was chosen by not Einstein for several reasons, none of which I think were weighted above any other. He knows how to take a punch. He has no problem standing up in a fight in which there's little to no hope of actually winning. He's obsessed with doing what's right. And while he doesn't want to kill people, he doesn't mind doing what he needs to in order to stop the abuses of power, which are happening. His hero's journey was finished presumably off screen when he was just getting beat up by some bullies in high school or something. But by the time this film begins, he's already arrived, which setup does make for an interesting source of drama, being that he is the right guy with the wrong equipment. But as the doc explained, the serum brings out what's inside. And I technically think he's telling the truth, but I'm not really sure there's a sciencey reason for you to become a gooder guy if you're a good guy or a badder guy if you're a bad guy. Instead, it's probably commentary on that old adage of absolute power corrupts absolutely. Against the backdrop of the Nazi regime, the writers were able to make this easy comparison with the Red Skull, as his influence, technology, infrastructure, and then power increases throughout the film, so does his tyranny, which would all reflect what was actually happening in our real world during that time. The Red Skull as a villain works as contrast to just how good Cap is. 
juxtaposing his 100% good against Skull's 100% evil. As I alluded several times throughout this field guide, the whole thing has a very Saturday morning cartoon vibe to it. Hep's only source of growth is really after he loses Bucky, and he has to come to grips with that loss, as well as settle the regrets he feels alongside respecting his friend's agency. In this, Cap is able to settle that there are some acceptable losses in battle, which, I mean, sure, lessons learned there for the future, but that doesn't quite create a satisfying arc for the character. Fortunately, considering that this film was so firmly establishing this unmovable object of good and righteousness, it is very effectively used in the future. So while Captain America brought in about $370 million into the box office against its $140 million budget, along with those other boxes that checked, but while it's a mile of chiseled jaw lines wide, it is just an inch deep in the ice. Thankfully, all that sweet, sweet revenue flowing in from ticket and toy sales, Marvel did greenlight a sequel in which fans would go on to absolutely love. But that's all I have to say about Captain America, the first Avenger. Join me next time when we talk about 2012's The Avengers.